Are you ready to take your business to the next level? Every day, there are countless books and articles that are published offering the key on how to make your business a success. It's easy to feel overwhelmed trying to keep up and run your business. That's why Deb Creer created the Business Power Hour. Keep up on the latest trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. Let the Business Power Hour do the heavy work for you. Good morning, good morning. I am Deb Creer, and I am passionate about giving professionals the tools that they need to make themselves and their businesses as successful as possible. And today we're going to talk a little business, but we're going to talk more about a personal situation that I share with this author, at least part of it. Um, and you know, we're going to have so much fun today. I'm going to give a little disclaimer. We're talking about breast cancer, folks. So, and and I'm talking with someone who has a wicked sense of humor. So we might use some words that you know people might go ooh at, but. That's all right. Um, you know, and, and so please join me in welcoming CJ Grace to our program today. Welcome, CJ. How are you? Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be on the Business Power Hour. I love it. I love it. Well, let me tell people just a little bit about you and then we will dive into this because we really are going to have so much fun. So former BBC journalist CJ Grace is the author of My Wild Ride, how to, th how to Thrive After Breast Cancer and Infidelity, which was just released in October of 2022. It's a candid comic memoir and cancer survival guide. CJ dealt with the double whammy of discovering her husband's infidelity and shortly after being diagnosed with breast cancer by refusing to be a victim and keeping her wicked sense of humor. A lifelong Monty Python fan, an eye for absurdity pervades her writing and public speaking work. CJ's humorous self-help book, Adulterer's Wife, How to Thrive Whether You Stay or Not, was an international bestseller. When Ariana Huffington received a copy, she invited CJ to be a HuffPost contributor. After leaving the BBC, CJ worked as a broadcasting advisor for China Radio International in Beijing. She's currently based in the United States. Her mission is to help women transform adversity into opportunity. So again, CJ, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. I, I love it. I love it. Well, I always like to know a little bit about my guests and how they got to where they are today. Now, we're clearly going to be talking about that throughout the whole program, but kind of give us the thumbnail sketch of how it is that you went from journalist to author to inspirational speaker and everything in between. Well, you know, in a way, I was living a charmed life. I had this dream job with the BBC, interviewing celebrities and politicians and people making their mark on the world. Mm -hmm. And then I got a transfer to work for China Radio International in uh, Beijing, China, mm -hmm. which was a, a, a wonderful opportunity. Right. And there I had a fairy tale falling in love with an American guy mm -hmm. that, that was, was there too. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, everything seemed fantastic, but fast forward to mm -hmm. our 25th wedding anniversary. Uh-oh. That was the best one ever, mm -hmm. spent in Hawaii, mm -hmm. didn't think things could change. Mm -hmm. But just two years later, both my marriage and my health was in tatters because mm -hmm. my husband was carrying on an affair with a woman half his age, whom mm -hmm. he refused to give up. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer for the second time mm. because I carried that uh, dreaded BRCA mm. gene that Angelina Jolie had believed could be a death sentence. So it was a double whammy that mm. left me reeling. Um, so when I first found out about my husband's infidelity, he actually offered me a part-time wife position. Excuse me? Excuse me. <laughs> I'd be perfectly happy spending two or three days a week with her and mm -hmm. the rest of the week with you. And I actually considered that proposal mm -hmm. for quite some time, mm -hmm. trying to get my head around it. Right. Uh, how would then, this work? Mm -hmm. Yes, how would, I didn't want everything to collapse, mm -hmm. you know, but then I got breast cancer and it made it very clear, mm -hmm. you know, because when I was undergoing chemo, mm -hmm. he was in Europe with his girlfriend mm -hmm. and 
it was very. I believe you said bonking her in your book. Bonk, yes, bonking <laughs> his his babe in 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 Europe, and it was very clear that a part time wife position was not going to work for me. So you know, I have to say it wasn't a it wasn't a pleasant path in many ways. But um, from having been somebody that helped him write his books. I became somebody that wrote my own books, mm -hmm. and went back to my mm -hmm. journalist background and, and came out with, with the first book, mm -hmm. Adulterer's Wife, How to Thrive Whether You Stay or Not. And the mantra of that book was that the best revenge is to get past the need for it. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was my aim because I saw so much vitriol out mm -hmm. there when I looked right. at uh, stuff people have written online. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that was going to help me. That would keep mm -hmm. me churning in the same situation. Um, and I didn't really think I had another book in me. But then after the breast cancer, mm -hmm. out it came, you know, like Delhi diarrhea. Mm -hmm. I had all right. these ideas and, mm -hmm. and the book pretty much wrote itself mm -hmm. in effect. Right. So um, it, 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 it's more that I see I see so much absurd humor in tragedy. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to do that because right. if you don't laugh, you cry. Mm -hmm. And who wants to cry? It's much better to laugh. Right. So, so, so that was the, the main part of, of, of my writing, to try mm -hmm. to find the humor, even in dark subjects. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and, and it, it's, it, it was a challenge to do all of this, like you said, you know, because you were healing mentally and physically um you know and and uh, you know so i'm assuming writing the book was kind of a catharsis to to help Absolutely. work through yes yes um and it was a, also a way of remembering part of it came from writing emails to people ah. about all these bizarre, bizarre things that happened mm -hmm. especially going through cancer you 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 just there's crazy stuff right you know, when you're lying on, on having your radiation and, mm -hmm. and up there, you see these, they try to make it look like a- I know, a, there's a beach situation. scene up there. Mm -hmm. Yes, oh, so I'm not, I'm not getting radiated right. getting mm -hmm. sun, you know. Mm -hmm. No, it was pretty obvious. It doesn't quite mm -hmm. feel like you're really out there in a tropical paradise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, and, and, you know, having been there, done that, it's most uncomfortable. You're in, in a, a wonkadoodle position you're cold, um, you know, and, and of course, one of the things that I discovered very early on in my breast cancer journey is modesty is gone. I mean, you oh, know, yeah. everybody in the world sees your bosoms or your lack thereof, you know, right. and it's just like, ugh, you know, you just kind of feel like you go somewhere and you just flip your shirt up. Okay, <laughs> because yes. you know they're gonna ask, right? Yes, yes. And they mark it with Sharpie here and there to get mm -hmm. you in the right position. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and um, but, but yeah, it's what I loved about your book was, yes, I have been through all of that. Um, and it was, it really was funny. Uh, and, and I have been the same way. I'm, you know, you gotta, you gotta, now we do cry. Let's, you know, yes. You know, there are times where it's like, no, you know, and, and, but, you know, then, then it's like, okay, pick myself up. And, and we go on, you know, I've, I've been known to tell, uh, you know, when they come in now, what's your name and birth date? I look at them and I smile sweetly and I say, Anastasia Beaverhausen, <laughs> which of course totally throws them. Um, and, you know, but yeah, you have to have humor. Um, you know, it was, it was the TV show MASH where somebody, you know, at, you know, because you know, they, they were always laughing and joking. And, and I remember distinctly, one of the people said, why do you laugh so much? And they said, because if we didn't, all we would do is cry. And, and that really is so very true. That's right. And that, that, that was my, that was my, my, my mantra mm -hmm. for infidelity was the best revenge is to get past the need for it. But right. my mantras for cancer mm -hmm. were information is power because mm -hmm. I really think at least being an anal right. mm -hmm. BBC journalist, mm -hmm. I needed to research everything mm -hmm. and feel comfortable with what mm -hmm. was presented to me. And I felt quite happy to negotiate, which right. I did. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I did that, for example, over the cocktail they wanted to mm -hmm. give me for chemo. Right. Mm -hmm. They were they wanted to give me uh, adriamycin and mm -hmm. uh, taxol. And I 
look that up. I have a history in my family of heart disease. And, right. I thought, and it is yeah, nasty no. hard on your heart. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, and for my triple negative tumor um, that I had the second time, it seemed like carboplatin was a probably a better option. Right. So my oncologist was actually quite happy to switch that mm -hmm. formula mm -hmm. and give me the carboplatin instead. Mm -hmm. It's still not brilliant for your system, but it is mm -hmm. better than Right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, chemo is just nasty stuff. Um, oh, yeah. But oh yeah, yeah. you know, and, and as I was reading your book, I mean, that was really what I was struck by was the fact that yes, it's funny. Yes, there's a lot, but it's also very informative with lots of of great information. And and one of the big things is, you know, you are the person in charge, and you know whatever the doctors, friends, whoever say, you're still the person in charge. And part of that is you are in charge of doing your own research. Um, and I think that has changed a lot from, you know, as, as we've gotten older, all these, because we don't, you know, we, it used to be that you did not question the medical people. What they were telling you was written in stone. There was nothing you could do. And that is no longer the case, you know, and, and so talk to us more about that. Yeah. And I mean, especially since I had already um, had a, separation or whatever from my husband we weren't divorced at the time that mm -hmm. I went through this but we were in effect sort of mm -hmm. semi-separated right mm -hmm. and so I couldn't rely on him to be my advocate mm -hmm. um one example I do give in the book for um uh, probably the best known cancer memoir was the one by Joan London had mm -hmm. I known um, she has um, a very long dedication at the beginning of her book, two pages of which mm -hmm. are devoted to her husband, thanking mm -hmm. him for how mm -hmm. amazing he was at taking care mm -hmm. of her. Well, um, I have uh, no dedication. No, no, book, there wasn't um, that. Thanking a husband for mm -hmm. his um, undying um, mm -hmm. help, because that wasn't really the case for me. I, I did have to be my own advocate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some people do find that they can rely on others. Mm -hmm. I had to rely on myself mm -hmm. to, to find out what was going on. Right. And I think that's important. It's important to feel comfortable with the treatment you get. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing I will say that everybody and their mother's uncle had cancer advice for me. Oh, yeah. And some of it, it was, was really good. And some of oh, it is totally off the wall. Because I did both alternative, I did both conventional mm -hmm. chemo and radiation, right. and I did a lot of alternative mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, you know, my more hippy diffy friends would say to me, Oh, uh, you know, chemo and radiation is toxic and doesn't work. Yes, you need to take this plant root extract uh, uh, and, and mumble uh, a lot. Mumble a lot. And then the, the people who were more straight laced who saw me do some alternative stuff, so oh, alternative medicine is pure quackery, mm -hmm. you know. And and then um, one person whom I will not name to protect his uh, identity, um, he was saying things like, oh, you got cancer because you're so tense. You need to run. Oh, I know. And let's you know, let's blame the patient and shout at them because shouting at somebody to relax is a very effective way mm -hmm. to get them to relax. Right. Not, you know, if you try that with a child, it doesn't work either. You have no. to be nice to mm -hmm. them, you know, and help them calm down and relax. Shouting at somebody mm -hmm. doesn't help them relax. Yeah. No. Um, and then the other thing that people would say, oh, you have to give up this, or we have to give up that. If you don't give up milk, if you don't give up dairy or cancer. Water. I was back. told water. I'm like, water? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Well, I'm a Brit. I've got to have milk in my tea. I'm yes. not going to have oaty or soy milk or some. No, some milk, whole thing. milk. Whole milk in my tea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm still around, but right. um, you know, you, the, the thing is that people get all fire and brimstone on you. And it, I would have needed more than 72 hours in the day to do all the anti-cancer stuff that people recommended mm -hmm. I should do if I didn't want to kick the bucket right away. Right. Oh yeah. And, and you just have to go with your gut mm -hmm. and do what you feel is right. And I would never, and this is one thing that I do say in my book, I tell people what I did, but I would never, presume to tell somebody else how they should treat their right. cancer. Mm -hmm. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical mm -hmm. profession pr professional. And um, it is definitely um, somebody's personal decision. Mm -hmm. There are right. so many 
different ways to deal with mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it's a crapshoot. I have to say that um, early stage, non-metastatic breast cancer, well, the survival statistics, the five-year survival statistics for that are damn good. They're close mm -hmm. to 100%. Right. But that being said, there are no guarantees. Mm -hmm. um, and I know people who've gone all conventional standard mm -hmm. medicine, some have, some have survived, some haven't. Right. People who've gone all alternative, some of those have survived, some of them haven't. Mm -hmm. Who right. knows? You right. know, it's the luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. It's just well, the luck and of the each draw. body is different. Um, you know, I tell people, you know, no one is the same. You, you might get the exact same diagnosis, but that's where it ends because your body tolerates things differently. Your mind tolerates things differently. I mean, there's so much that goes into it. And, and so I also tell them, you know, and so don't just assume that what you have is normal, you know, like with chemo, you know, that's, that's probably one of the best examples. People assume they're going to get sick. They're going to be nauseated. And I tell them, that's not always the case. You know, you need to tell your doctors, this is what happened because they might change things. They, you know, now it, you know, and, and yeah, so there's all sorts of things. And, but we just assume, oh, it's, it's supposed to be like this. And yeah. we never stop to think, you know, even if it's going to be like that, what can they do to help? Um, you know, because as much as we love our doctors and sometimes put them up on great pedestals, they aren't mind readers. Yeah. And actually I, I was surprised I didn't have too bad a ride with, with chemo, mm -hmm. but I did a lot of alternative stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I remember going to see my radiologist when we were planning, I'd still, I was still undergoing chemo, but you have to plan the radiation mm -hmm. session. Right. Mm -hmm. And my radiologist said to me, hmm, you're looking far too healthy to be on chemo. What are you doing? I hope you're not doing something that's negating the effects of the right. chemotherapy. Well, my mm -hmm. hair was all falling out. It had mm -hmm. all fallen out. So it obviously had gone through my system. Mm -hmm. But what she was telling me was that I simply did not look sick enough. Yes, you weren't pitiful. Kind of bizarre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but clearly, some of the alternative stuff I did mm -hmm. was very effective right. um, at dealing with mm -hmm. um, the side effects of chemotherapy. Right. Right. You know, and, and I do tell people also, if you're doing the alternate, make sure your doctor knows, because there are some things that you could be doing that that might cause issues, um, you know, and, and so it's good for them to know these are the vitamins, these are the supplements, all of those various things. And, a, and if your doctor is a good doctor, they will combine all of that. Um, you know, I tell people, it, fire them. You know, if, if you don't <laughs> like the, the plan, then you need to fire them and find somebody else. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like a, a very good friend of mine who um, he suddenly had a, he had a, a cancer that blew up the side of his face. Mm. He didn't realize that was what it was. Mm -hmm. um, went to the uh, uh, ER and um, he had to persuade them to do a biopsy. They weren't even that willing to do it. Right. But then the doctor just calls him up and says mm -hmm. to him, you better get your affairs in order. It's inoperable. Um, Yikes. You know, and, and I mean, no bedside manner whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And um, so this was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, he decided, mm, I'm going to get a second opinion mm -hmm. on that. He found right. um, He found a surgeon that was able mm -hmm. to operate on mm -hmm. his tonsil cancer as mm -hmm. it was. So, um, yeah, you just, uh, you don't know. You know, right. you have to, you have mm -hmm. to really... Um, do mm -hmm. the research yeah. and not necessarily take what one doctor right. says as gospel. And yeah. Dr. Google is not exactly the best place. I mean, you know, yeah. so when, when you're on Google, make sure that what you're reading is good information, um, you know, and, and whether it's traditional or non-traditional, you know, there's, you're going to see all sorts of, of different things. So just make sure that you're taking into account, okay, this, you know, who is this source? Right. Um, yeah. Although I have to say that um, I found from the time I had breast cancer first in 2007 mm -hmm. on my left side, mm -hmm. and it wasn't as bad a case as mm -hmm. the one I had on my right side in 2014. 
Um, and I found that um, Google at that point was actually far better and far more mm -hmm. in terms of looking up alternative medicine. Mm -hmm. um, right now, at least at the time that we're recording this, I find that DuckDuckGo mm -hmm. um, and uh, Brave actually give you um, better results yeah. in terms of alternative mm -hmm. medicine. One uh, notable example of that, because I did a lot of reading um, mm -hmm. when I was going through cancer and also as part of the research for my uh, book, mm -hmm. uh, uh, My Wild Ride, How to Thrive After Breast Cancer and Infidelity. Um, and uh, one book really um, uh, stuck in my mind. You know, it was it was uh, very compelling. It's called Dress to Kill, The ah. Link Between Bras and Breast Cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, actually, I think it's called Dress to Kill, The Link Between Breast Cancer and Bras. Mm -hmm. it's the right way around by mm -hmm. Sydney Ross Singer and his mm -hmm. wife, Soma Grismeyer. Mm -hmm. I'm probably mispronouncing her name there. But um, anyway, they found that the link between bras and breast cancer is stronger than that between smoking and lung cancer. Hmm. And in the later edition of their Well, book, you're compressing uh, those girls and uh, you know. Yeah, you're it, right. It's um, all the toxins collect in fatty tissue, toxins mm -hmm. and waste products in the body. And where do we women have a lot of fatty tissue? In our breasts. Mm -hmm. And if you're squeezing them with a tight bra for mm -hmm. many hours a day, you're preventing the lymph flow. The right. lymphatic mm -hmm. system would normally be flushing those mm -hmm. toxins out of the body mm -hmm. um, and out of that area mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, that's the um hypothesis mm -hmm. that the um the, the the singers put out in that mm -hmm. book um but they quote a number of studies that seem to that, that seem to show very conclusively that mm -hmm. that's the case and when they look at indigenous societies where um, women don't wear bras mm -hmm. the rate of breast cancer between men and women is almost the same mm -hmm. Unbelievable. I mean, how right. many men do you know mm -hmm. with breast cancer? Right. I mm -hmm. think I know one. Mm -hmm. Only right. because he runs a mm -hmm. he does a podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, scores and scores of women who, mm -hmm. who've had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. right. But the trouble is that, you know, they thought that the authors thought that they would be welcomed with open arms by mm -hmm. the um, mainstream cancer community. Right. And in fact, they weren't. They weren't. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the mainstream cancer community just points to one study, only one study that was done in 2014 that shows no uh, significant link mm -hmm. between bras and breast cancer. But the problem with that one study that they point mm -hmm. to is that it had no control group. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that would be like studying smoking in London right. without mm -hmm. including anybody who was a non-smoker. Mm -hmm. um, but also, more importantly, um, they only used post-menopausal women in whom the effect was far less strong. Right. Mm -hmm. so, because so, the hormones are so different. That's yes, really, yeah. yes. So mm -hmm. so so um and and when I if if you do an experiment, you know, you Google you use Google to find mm -hmm. to to uh, look up the link between bras and breast mm -hmm. cancer, and all you get are articles that are quoting that one study that refutes mm -hmm. this uh, theory. Right. Then you're going to think, uh, "Wow, yeah, mm -hmm. right." But DuckDuckGo, mm -hmm. um, other and other mm -hmm. search engines um, do show mm -hmm. that particular right. hypothesis, which to me and the way it's written in the book and the other studies I've seen, it's it's compelling. Mm -hmm. I and I wrote an article about this on my. Uh, website. Mm -hmm. I normally also write for Thrive Global, but mm -hmm. or had written for Thrive Global, but I'd, for, for whatever reason, this was too hot for them to handle. Yeah. They didn't they mm -hmm. didn't want to uh, mm -hmm. run that particular right. um that particular mm -hmm. story. But um and and if you have wire, the underwire is Oh that's even worse. worse. Mm -hmm. Because it does act as an, an antenna mm -hmm. to um attract right. EMF right. fields into into mm -hmm. into that. And I actually have a very bizarre personal story about that which which indicate which shows you how um how that works um my son my youngest son when he was maybe eight or so was fitted with that underwire that oh you know it's oh yeah the retainer headpiece yes. thingy mm -hmm. the, the wire that you, that you wear mm -hmm. outside right. mm -hmm. your, uh, jaw and um the first night that he uh, slept in it um 
he was he came to me in the morning he was absolutely terrified he said mom mom there's a monster in the closet i couldn't sleep at all and uh, and, and there's something there and and i thought oh what's going on is there some kind of psychic thing in mm -hmm, his right so i had this emf meter mm -hmm. and i'd heard you know when you look at those shows the, the ghostbuster shows mm -hmm. on, on tv they find weird emf mm -hmm. globes in in the rooms where the woman has died or whatever it is right so there's I'll, something I'll, I'll check this out mm -hmm. nothing in his closet mm -hmm. absolutely nothing but there was a straight line of high activity high emf down his ceiling right by his bed ah uh, to his headpiece what was going on and it only showed up when his brother in the next room had his computer on. Ah. So what it was, was dirty electricity in mm -hmm. that line right. going mm -hmm. above his mm -hmm. head in the ceiling. And then his headgear picks mm -hmm. it up right. and the disturbance in his brain while he's sleeping, he mm -hmm. thinks there's some kind of right. mm -hmm. in the closet. Because it was, so yeah, there, there, yeah. It, it created a disturbance in his brain that, and that was how he interpreted it. Mm -hmm. So if the headgear is picking up dirty electricity, mm -hmm in the same way and right. under wire under mm -hmm. your breasts right. is going to do that yeah. too right so 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 that was a that was a, a very mm -hmm. interesting illustration of, mm -hmm. of of how you can have mm -hmm. dirty electricity right. coming right into you if you are wearing metal stuff mm -hmm. i wonder whether it's coming into my glass i know oh my glasses oh my God. Yeah. yes um, i should have plastic ones this is yes work. yes <laughs> i know well and you know studies it all depends on who interprets them as right. to what you know and i remember who pays, you know, who pays for them right um, mm -hmm. who they choose as their as their group of uh, participants mm -hmm. um there's a great book out there i do quote it in my in my mm -hmm. uh, in my book called um doctoring data by mm -hmm. malcolm right. Pendrick, mm -hmm. and he has a wonderful quote mm -hmm. he says making an making an absolute mountain making a relative mountain out of an absolute molehill mm -hmm, right making a relative mountain mm -hmm. out of an absolute molehill and mm -hmm. what that is is that you know you can have a study of say a thousand people mm -hmm. a thousand people in the control a thousand people in the study taking whatever drug it is they're, they're checking mm -hmm. and say one person in the control gets better and two people in the drug group right. yes. then they say 50 well, percent yeah they mm -hmm. say well no they say it's a it's a yeah 50 percent more it, it, but yeah. really uh -huh. when you look at it it's only one out of a thousand Three. yeah or, yeah the, the mm -hmm. absolute value is one right. out of a thousand mm -hmm. uh you know right and the relative value is that mm -hmm. the one turns into two right Right. um so so yeah you have to look at the absolute values right. because otherwise right. you're not getting right. the correct well, picture you know years ago i and i tell people you know when when i was diagnosed with cancer i knew just enough to be dangerous because i had worked for an oncologist and i also worked for the american cancer society and so you know i did know just enough to be dangerous but you know so 30 ish years ago when i worked for the cancer society i was you know communications that was what i did for them and a study came out that women who had never had children had a higher incidence rate of breast cancer and and that's actually you know if you dug down what it was, oh, was, because it was they the weren't hormones breastfeeding, they weren't breastfeeding, yeah maybe. well and and yeah. yeah and 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 you had different hormones going on in your body all of those various things and so it, it actually made sense but what got latched onto and reported was because lesbians don't have children they're going to have more breast cancer and it was like what <laughs> <laughs> Not, yeah, and, I mean, yeah and it was and, and i remember true. talking to reporters yeah i was talking to reporters saying oh no God. you know that's that's not that is not the case at all um you know but that was that was a conclusion that somebody reached that then went you know wild with it and it was so bizarre because that that wasn't you know in the study at all i mean it was just you know women who had never given birth because of hormone differences all those various things have a higher incidence rate of a certain type of breast cancer i mean in that that actually made sense when you looked at it but but yeah when they went now who doesn't have babies oh 
our agenda says we need to talk about this. Um, and, and that was exactly what happened, uh, you know, and, and so, yeah, I remember giving interviews going, no. <laughs> Right, right. Oh my goodness. Um, but yeah, but, and, and I have to say, I applaud you for choosing to stay flat because mm -hmm. um, implant illness is mm -hmm. very, very real. Right. Oh and, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and they, Nicole Deruda has a Facebook group, Healing mm -hmm. Implant, Healing mm -hmm. Breast Implant Illness right. um, Facebook group. Well, those uh, little buggers they, leak. She, she, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she has more than a, she, I think she has around 170,000 right. members on that group. And um, yeah, I mean, so many issues and the doctors do, do not tell you about that before right. oh, you yeah. go in for yeah, um, and it was Yeah, when I was first diagnosed, it was interesting because I had decided to have the double mastectomy, you know, even though it was just on one side, I thought, okay, I'm not gonna worry about the other side and I'm not gonna be lopsided. So, you know, we're just gonna do this all at once. But I was considering having implants. And so I went to a plastic surgeon. Now I'm, I'm here in Atlanta and somehow I went to the plastic surgeon for all of the real housewives and, you know, people like that. I mean, this is the nicest doctor's office I'd ever been in. I was like, oh my gosh. Oh, the cosmetic ones. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, so, you know, he's talking about, and, and one of the things I discovered is they do, you know, because you're, you're always thinking, ooh, I want to be larger. Right. Um, and, and they said, no, they really want to, have you be the same size you were before because that's what your body is built for you know things like that and and so you know he and i were kind of having this discussion but then you have to get measured and pictures taken and out of everything i have been through in the last six years that was absolutely the most mortifying i mean it was wow. just it was horrible and like part of it so one of the things that, that we were considering and this is actually you know it's it's a it's it is a relatively good solution is they can use your own body fat as, as the implant. So they came at me with calipers to measure how much fat I had in my stomach. Now I was at the, you know, I was thinking, oh, look, I get lipo at the same time. I mean, you know, but I mean, it was, and, and taking pictures, I mean, it was, ugh. and, and at that point I thought, um, nope, I am absolutely not going to do this. This was just not, you know, and, and, and of course that whole process is very hard on your body because there's things that they have to put in your body while you're healing before you can have the implants. And a lot of that goes wrong. I mean, there's just, you know, and, but that said, you, if you want to do that, just make sure you've done your research because right. there are certainly safer ways there's there's all sorts of things that that you know have changed even in the last five years from from when I was considering it. But yeah, it was you know when I had to make that decision, it was nah, you know. And, no. and I mean, using your own body fat is probably the mm -hmm. the lesser of the evils, right. except for mm -hmm. the fact that you're having multiple operations instead of right. operations mm -hmm. only on your breasts mm -hmm. because the silicone. You know, mm -hmm. if silicone leaks, that's a big problem. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. silicone bags themselves that the mm -hmm. saline ones are in mm -hmm. is also a problem right. mm -hmm. if they line leaks it's not so much mm -hmm. of a problem for the body mm -hmm. but um what's interesting is that generally the medical profession particularly um plastic surgeons um do try to um make light of this issue try to say that it isn't actually happening mm -hmm. and one of the things that that i found it was so outrageous that it was funny you know there is a, a the latest study that was financed by um plastic surgeons um, uh, in fact, I got it here because it only just came out. It hasn't been published yet, but it's been published online. But they, the influence of personality on health complaints and quality of life in women with breast implants. <laughs> and of course, what do they say? You know, the you're happier when you have the girls they're, again. They're, they're, it, neuroticism is a big reason why women complain about right. breast implants. They're all neurotic. Oh my goodness, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, this is the most ridiculous mm -hmm. study that I've right. ever seen, but it's out there being taken seriously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, women who attended the plastic surgery outpatient clinic of Maastricht University Medical Center between October 2020 and 21, 2021. And these were ones who just had it for cosmetic reasons. Mm -hmm. And so they like to say, well, women who have cosmetic surgery, they're pretty vain and neurotic anyway. So when we get them to fill out this survey mm -hmm. to try to make out they're even more neurotic. And then yeah. they can, we can say, if they're complaining about mm -hmm. breast implant illness, 
Well, it's obviously because they're neurotic. Right, yeah. yes. There's well, nothing they're, wrong with them. No, they're just neurotic. Hypochondriacs. Mm -hmm. Well, right. it's just, oh yeah. my goodness. Well, and, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, there are just, there's so many things that can go wrong with implants. And, you know, and, and now I'll be honest, part of it too was my age. If I had been, say, 25, that would have been a very different decision. But, you know, I was like, no, I'm old. I don't care. I get to wear baggy t-shirts the rest of my life. Um, you know, and, and now I do have my, um, my, my girls that I wear, you know, for, for certain things. Because for one thing, women's clothes are designed for you to have breasts and so if right. you don't they fit funny um you know and 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 you know and and but you know it's it's like whatever um you know and and uh, it, you know and and typically i you know i don't i mean you know i'm just uh, well i'm sitting here in my office who cares the cats don't care i mean you know and and so but yeah again that's another one of those things that you need to research and and just really find out and and you know make sure that you know because they are putting a foreign object into your body so right. you just need to know what the ramifications of that are. Um, but, you know, in your book, you also talk about a lot of the other f things like chemo. I mean, chemo is obviously one of the, the biggest things. There's so many different protocols um, and, and all sorts of things. And, you know, you sailed through. Oh, I did not. I had my one thing and it dang near killed me. Um, you know, I spent seven weeks in the hospital and, you know, and, and have had multiple complications, all sorts of things after that. Would I do it again? Yes. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, since that time, every scan I have shows everything's gone. So I don't know, you know, if, if but, but, you know, it's, there's, uh, there's so many other options now to putting those horrible toxic chemicals into your body. And, and part of it is mindset. I mean, you know, m I knew that what I needed was chemo. That's just my mindset. You know, we talk about how everybody's different. Somebody else might go, nope, not, mm -mm. And, and so if you gave them chemo, it would make them worse because they knew it was going to make them worse. I mean, you know, that's, that's the whole thing. And so, uh, right. It's like an unplacebo right. in mm -hmm. a way. Yeah. 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 If you have an idea mm -hmm. that something's going to harm you. It will. Uh, you're, mm -hmm. you're trying, you're right. actually putting that mm -hmm. idea into your mm -hmm. body. Right. Yeah. right. Right. But, but, you know, I have to go to one thing that, that I'd like to, to mention. Positive thinking is a bit of a tightrope right. because there is the tyranny. Mm -hmm. Right. Of people trying to impose positive thinking on you. Mm -hmm. right. um, you know, some people who really dealt with stuff going wrong with, for themselves mm -hmm. by, by being very negative mm -hmm. um, would try and bash me over the head saying, you know, I'm not positive enough and I'm not going to mm -hmm. get better. I'm not positive enough and all of this. And, you know, you should never make somebody feel bad about mm -hmm. feeling bad. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know, and you can't manufacture positive thinking. Mm -hmm. What I did was I used things like laughter therapy mm -hmm. um, to bring you up You did a chocolate food. therapy yeah, too. and chocolate therapy and, and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I have a, on my website, I actually have a, 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 a chocolate mindfulness mm -hmm. exercise, you know. Um, so, so yeah, if you do things that bring mm -hmm. you up, you stay, you, you hang out with friends that bring mm -hmm. you up rather than bring you right. down, mm -hmm. all of those kinds of things, lift your mood mm -hmm. and then you do have a positive mm -hmm. attitude um, right. but you have to you have to do those things i made sure for example i only watched comedies not depressing mm -hmm. dramas right um i'm you know a former bbc journalist but mm -hmm. i gave up watching the news because it's all bad news. right it's there's and nothing the good in the news mm -hmm. they don't cover good news mm -hmm. Um, so, so, you know, th that's what I did be mm -hmm. because I knew I needed to lift mm -hmm. my mood and, and humor is a wonderful way of, right. of getting your positive mm -hmm. attitude back. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the times when I was going in for surgery, I'm like, I normally am just yabber, 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 you know, and, and I'm chit chatting with everybody, you know, I'm, I'm there you know, on the table, you know, in the most, you know, un unpleasant way, all that good stuff. But I'm still just like this. And I heard one of the nurses say, oh, dear, she must be so nervous. <laughs> and and I said, OK, yes, I am. I'm nervous. I said, but I trust, you know, the, the doctors. I said, but more importantly, if I can make you all laugh before we start this, I think that's going to that is going to go better. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, 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 yeah, and you know, did I know the seriousness of what they were doing? Yes. I mean, there was not, you know, it, 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 and all of those things, but yeah, it was like, 
we're just going to sit here and laugh and you know and, and we see you know videos and, and things like that where the nurses are dancing and and all sorts of things and because it's it's not just you it is everybody around you you know and and if they're getting ready to do say a surgical procedure or something and they're all then that's going to can potentially cause problems also so you know what if if i can make them laugh then i'm going to make them laugh Right, because absolutely, they will do a better job. No right. question. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, you know, how do you get good service from somebody? Do you piss them off? Do you, right. do you make them feel yeah. uncomfortable? Am, am I going to worry that the waitress is yeah. spitting my food? <laughs> yes, right, 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 right. It's obvious. And, and um, mm -hmm. it's such an obvious thing, but it's a shame that most so many people don't realize it, because I think mm -hmm. the world would be a much better place mm -hmm. if they did. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I'm serious at the points where I have to be serious. Um, you know, like when I tell them my name is Anastasia Beaverhausen, it's not going to be a time when they're going to screw something up. Um, you know, and, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there are certainly the things that, that, you know, when you, when you need to be serious, you need to be serious. Um, but, uh, and, and sometimes I also, you need to be serious so that they know that you're understanding, um, you know, and, and right. but, yeah, it's like, you I, know, I, one of my doctors, uh, so I see a, a, a kidney specialist now because you know all of this and she's so funny i love her she's actually my second kidney doctor i fired the first one just didn't didn't hit it off with her you know she was very competent but i just didn't hit it off and so i switched doctors and and when i went in one time she said i am so glad it's you i need to laugh <laughs> and i thought now that's kind of sad <laughs> right 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 um but but yeah it's you know and, and so we sat there and we chit chatted and and had a good time same with my primary care doctor it's really funny because you know i've i've had you know the double mastectomy before that i had a hysterectomy so there's you know there's like no parts and so when you go for an annual exam as a woman there's nothing for them to examine on me. I don't take I don't take my clothes off. Um, and so we just kind of chat about things and and but you know the funny thing was you know we talk about you know you know telling people and being honest in these things. So the last time I went into my primary care doc, you know, we we're chatty chatty and she said, Is there anything else? And I said, Well, you know, I do have this thing on my arm. <laughs> and she took one look at it and I was at the dermatologist. And, you know, and danged if it wasn't basal cell carcinoma. Oh. And, you know, but it was it was the funniest thing because it's very small, but I'd, I'd had it for over a year and it was this thing that kept bleeding. And I just kept thinking I was banging it and, you know, breaking, you know, making it bleed. And, you know, it wasn't. And and the dermatologist, he and I had been this chatty, chatty, happy, laughy thing. Um, and and then he got the results of the biopsy. And I had not told him about any of this other because it's my arm. He didn't need to know that I had breast cancer and kidney complications because it didn't pertain to this thing on my arm. Right. And so all of a sudden he goes from being happy, laughing doctor to serious cancer doctor and, and you know and he starts telling me now this is basal cell carcinoma but don't worry it is not the type of cancer that spreads you will not have any enemy and he had, you know he had this whole different tone of voice and i started laughing and he's like, and so he <laughs> thinks i'm i'm shook up and i said no 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 i said you need to understand i have stage four breast cancer this thing on my arm is nothing <laughs> um and so but but yeah it's it, it but yeah it's just like, well, what's the end? look i got a, i got something else i mean it was just um but uh but yeah it's it is you know it, it, it we go through all of these mental things and um you know one of the things you talk about in the book is how you know and you mentioned this with your friend we get blamed for having cancer or we think right. how, why did we how did we do this to ourselves right was I not exercising enough was i not doing this enough nobody knows i mean even when you have those genes there are a lot of people who have those genes and never get it you know right. whatever the, the right. disease right. is and so you know the the whole blame game i think is is one of the the most difficult things to to deal with yeah, I think that's an extremely uh, negative way of, of looking at it, because whatever it is, it's just like when I when I got cancer for the second time, one ex friend kept bombarding me with all these things that cause cancer in emails. Right. And, you know, that horse had 
bolted. I've already got the cat. Yeah, I've already been, you've been there, yeah, done you that. You don't need to tell me that, you know, this, that, the other. And obviously, I must have done what, any of the, all of these things to have got my cancer. I no, think you have like two pages of it. Could have been this yeah. and this and this and this and this. Right, and this. right, right, right. I mean, everything, pretty much everything causes cancer right. in this modern world. Living and causes what, cancer. What do do? Should we have a prophylactic suicide yes. to avoid getting cancer? Right. I don't think so, you yeah. know. Um, but um, and, and one of the things that I found interesting also writing a book, because it's unusual to have a book that combines both breast cancer and infidelity. Right. Because mm -hmm. um, yeah, not a lot of people go through that. Uh, well, actually, way more, more, more do you, you talk think. about this in the book, more do than we think. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the st stress causes cancer mm -hmm. and infidelity and marital breakup is a massive Right. cause of stress mm -hmm. um and, and you have the opposite where you've got somebody who has cancer and the spouse can't deal males. yeah especially if if it's the female that has the cancer mm -hmm. and the male that's okay because sadly you know females have the caretaker genes mm -hmm. whereas right. men don't seem to mm -hmm. and um a study by um glance um mm -hmm and others uh which showed very conclusively mm -hmm. that um when there is serious illness mm -hmm. if if it's a man that's ill the woman is much more likely to stay than if it's a mm -hmm. serious illness right. affecting the woman mm -hmm. um often the men mm -hmm. bail they just can't deal mm -hmm. with it i'm not saying that every man is like that but yeah i mean i was you know, incredibly lucky i mean my husband has been phenomenal through through all of this but yeah i know that that's that is you know and you said you were you worked for um the american cancer society mm -hmm. did you come across um broken marriages accompanying um cancer or was that not something that as a communications person did they didn't that? talk about it a lot but again this was 30 ish years ago um you know and and so yeah they really didn't you know, I don't remember any studies or anything like that at that point. Um, but you, know, you certainly saw it where it was just, it puts so much stress, you know, same thing with, with say the death of a child, you know, it puts so much stress on the marriage that in many cases it just cannot withstand. Right. Um, and, and that's really what I've seen. And, and, um, uh, friends of mine who've been in the cancer world tell me they've seen that a lot. Mm -hmm um and whether what came first they're not always sure right. you know mm -hmm. did the infidelity come first and the marital issues come first or did the cancer come first mm -hmm. but it happens in both directions one often follows the other right. um and it's it's a sad thing but it's tr it's, it's it's just true mm -hmm. it's uh i don't think that i was um unusual mm -hmm. um in in having both but you you talk infidelity. about it which i think helps people right yeah and, and it i don't regret anything i'm i'm actually very grateful that i've been through all of this um bleak and difficult though it was right. yeah um, i tell people the same thing you know because regret is not about the past it's about the present mm -hmm. and if you're happy with the present as it is right now mm -hmm. then you don't regret the past right. and so for me um going through um infidelity and breast cancer has been incredible. I mean, I've gone through, I've had creativity, love, friendship, um, and joy that I never would have otherwise experienced. Right. Um, it's so, so I'm just actually grateful. Um, mm -hmm. I'm grateful to my husband's mistress, even though I wasn't very happy about her at the beginning. Mm -hmm. She's, now she's she saved you and you didn't. Yes, she <laughs> saved me and I'm, I'm so much happier. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so you just never know, you never know. And there's mm -hmm. al always, there's a silver mm -hmm. lining and there's right. always mm -hmm. hope. You know, right. that's the thing. You know, and you talk about this in your book, and I think we've talked about this too, is, is those relationships with people um you know i had friends that i thought would be my staunchest supporters dropped off the face of the earth and other people who i you know who have been absolutely fabulous that i never would have thought that um you know and and so it's been very interesting to to go through all of that and you know and and there are points where i have been annoyed mad sad when somebody, you know, that I've been friends with for a long time or, you know, it can't deal with it. And, and it was very interesting because um, a friend of mine on Facebook, we've never met in person and he, but he is an absolutely delightful man. 
he um, has uh, has had to, he's a lung transplant. Um, and he unfortunately is having major issues. And it's the other day he posted, you know, this actively dying is hard. And I literally did not know what to say. And part of it was because I thought the second I say something, I'm acknowledging that it's real. And it finally dawned on me, maybe that was why people that I thought would be supportive couldn't, you know, didn't do anything because they would be acknowledging, oh my gosh, she is, you know, having this. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and I actually posted and, and I said, you know, I really don't know what to say, but I know you'll deal with it with the strength you ha have been using, you know, whatever that outcome. But yeah, it, and, and it really did hit home to me that, you know, sometimes we ignore it because we don't want to think it's going to happen. And it's very hard. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's people don't know how to behave right. when someone has a serious mm -hmm. illness, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why I did have a cancer etiquette section. Mm -hmm. In the book, right? Yes, you've got this great, you know, it's it's great stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and and I understand, you know, it's it's uh, we aren't death is not something that is spoken about in our culture. There's right. a, this, mm -hmm. this culture of oh, no, no, we can't talk about it. It's mm -hmm. not part. Of it. But of course, we all die. Everybody mm -hmm. dies, mm -hmm. and it's necessary to mm -hmm. consider mm -hmm. what you want to do when right. you are close to that process. Mm -hmm. In fact. The, the last chapter of my yeah, book is, is on that, you know, those final peace. steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and steps that you should make before you've even got there, because right. so many people do not mm -hmm. get their affairs in order. Mm -hmm. And the last time you want to be having to deal with that is if you're if you actually have mm -hmm. a terminal illness, right. you mm -hmm. want to be dealing with it when mm -hmm. you're actually fine, you know, right. um, and well, living wills and, right. and all of yeah. that health care. And, and sometimes it's just simple things like, you know, when when I got so sick, I was very, very ill. Um, in ICU, all sorts of things. And later on, you know, we, we realized I was the person in, in our marriage, I paid all the bills. So, you know, all of that, you know, my husband had no idea what the passwords were to do online bill pay, any of that. In fact, he didn't have the password to get into my computer. <laughs> you know? And so, because all those fields are already filled in, right? You know, you go to the public, right, you, know, the, right. the, you know, we just, you know, and, and, but, you know, and, and so it's one of those things where people do need to know those things, especially if you're, you know, and, and, um, and if, you know, say it, it, you're, you're single, somebody needs to have that information. You need to have those powers of attorney, the, you know, the medical powers of attorney, all of those various things. And let's be honest, we need those now, you know, right. while you're healthy, yeah. while you're thinking right. about right. it, get because all I of that done. One um, of the things I write about is avoiding hospice hell, you right. know, mm -hmm. uh, avoiding, sorry, not hospice, avoiding nursing home hell, mm -hmm. because um, some people end up in nursing homes very unhappy with right. how they're treated. Mm -hmm. um, and when AARP Bulletin did a study um, mm -hmm. on how many people wanted to end their lives mm -hmm. in nursing homes, Surprise, surprise, most people do not. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you don't write that in a mm -hmm. directive, in a healthcare directive, and tell your, right. um, uh, mm -hmm. whoever it is you're mm -hmm. giving powers of attorney to, whether mm -hmm. it's your husband, your wife, your children, or a trusted friend, mm -hmm. um, those people need to know, and, that, mm -hmm. and those documents need to be given mm -hmm. to all your healthcare right. professionals mm -hmm. so that you don't find yourself um, having an end of mm -hmm. life that's far less pleasant mm -hmm. than it needs to be. Right. Um, so, so you know, and, and like I said, do it while you're healthy because Absolutely. things happen. You know, we're Absolutely. in car accidents. We, you know, uh, a friend of mine, very, very healthy young woman, all of a sudden her heart stopped. No indicators before any, now she's, you know, she's, she is very much with us now. She had to have a pacemaker put in, but, um, you know, it never would have occurred to her that because she was young, you know, all these various things. And, you know, so it is, you know, take those steps now, just because then, you know, if somebody has to deal with it, it's so much easier on them. You know, you don't want them to be going, we have no idea what, what they want, you know, whether it's cremated, buried, 
planted right. under a tree. That's one of the I'm happy with that. I can actually kind of like that. The red cremation was good enough for my cat, so it's good enough for me. I know, <laughs> I know. You know, and and you know, and 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 if you're cremated, then what? You know, where do your ashes go? I mean, all yeah. these various things. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and then of course, you know, you need the, the information about, okay, if I can't make medical decisions, what decisions are being made? Um, you know, and, and have some, even if, you know, it is just a friend or your doctors or whoever, you know, they, they need that information because we might not be able to tell them, no, 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 don't want that. Right. Absolutely. No. But, oh my gosh, CJ, this is, it, it's, it's a morbid funny, important subject, right? Um, and and the, I think part of the issue is we don't, you know, like I was saying, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think this happens. Um, and part of what I really liked your, about in your book was, yes, it was funny, but you also have very practical advice in there and just tips and things, you know, like, uh, you know, here's what might happen for radiation um, you know, here's what to consider when doing this. And so it's, it was just very informative while being very much, you know, a little bit of cheeky humor there on occasion. Well, thank you so much. And, um, I would like to say that, um, if any of, uh, any of your listeners would like to find out more about me, mm -hmm. they can go to my website, cjauthor.com and i better say that in an american accent so you can understand cj author right like writer <laughs> as in somebody's a writer cjauthor.com mm -hmm. and i do have a couple of free pdfs right. um, oh yes great you stuff can find out how to download um mm -hmm. one about um overcoming the roller coaster of negative emotions when you're going through infidelity and another one um 10 tips to stay sane after a breast cancer diagnosis so those are pretty useful pdfs that you can download i also have some other resources on that uh, website mm -hmm. about cancer and other things right. and, and right. infidelity as well yeah. so um so uh that's it really and mm -hmm. um big big message there's always hope you and i are both testaments to that, um, there's always hope, um, and you just put one foot in the in front of the other. Keep a sense of humor and keep laughing, and your life will right. be good. <laughs> right. You know, and it, it is one of those things. You know that that whatever the outcome is, we can deal with it. Um, you know, and and but we you know as we record this, uh, and as actually as it is broadcast, it is October. So that is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We did this on purpose, uh, you know, and, and for anybody out there, and you talk about this in your book, please go in and get your tests done, have your mammograms, have whatever, you know, and do those, the self exams, all of those things, because the sooner that you catch this, the, the more treatable it is, right. um, you know, and, and I know that there's a lot of discussion out there about, you know, mammograms, which, hey, I don't have to have anymore, um, but, you know, and, and, you know, and so there's, they're developing alternatives and, and things like that, but please don't think this can't happen to me because it can. And CJ and I are perfect examples of that. Right. We have to be screen queens. That's it. Screenings. <laughs> Get those girls checked. <laughs> well, CJ, this has been absolutely delightful. Um, again, your uh, website is cjauthor.com. I'll put my Midwest accent on author <laughs> and and so please check and, and lots of great tips information there there's links to your books we will have a link in in the show notes do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave with everyone well i think that just imagine if you can i have i have six tips on my website as to how to um, improve your mood and get off the emotional roller coaster that cancer and infidelity both put you into and however lousy you feel right now just remember time passes things will get better you just work at it and life will be better than it life can be better than it is now, if we didn't have adversity, if everything was just hunky-dory, more or less the same, it wouldn't give us a chance for personal growth. And personal growth is what leads to a better life. I love it. I love it. Well, I am Deb Creer. I've been having just an absolutely wonderful conversation with CJ Grace, who is the author of My Wild Ride how to thrive after breast cancer and infidelity. Um, and to everyone out there, have a great day. 
Tune in for our next program for even more trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. The Business Power Hour, hosted by Deb Creer, is proud to be part of the C-Suite Network.